So with that concept of mind that knowledge is empowering, every cybersecurity expert must be continuously improving their own knowledge base and knowledge set. They should never just get one certification say, that's all I need for my 8570 or my job requirement. I'm gonna sit on my laurels and collect a paycheck. That shouldn't be who you are in this industry. You should be constantly evolving because the technology and the threat and the landscape is also continuously evolving. There's a concept that to be secure on all sides is also to be weak on all sides. But if he is prepared, you should watch out. If there are certain conditions by which you'd want to attack, certain conditions that are more optimal to attack, there are certain conditions where you should embolden your own defenses. It's easy to just say, you know, the hacker community, there's so many of them out there. It could be from a kid in his, his parents' garage to the you know, nation state hackers or the groups, the big hacktivist groups. It could feel overwhelming that we are always going to never have the upper hand in the battle for, for cybersecurity. But there's a concept called asymmetric warfare that implies all principles of the CIA triad and a few more that can help us gain an advantage or to at least level the battlefield. Being deceptive, appearing to be weak when you're really strong, or appearing to be strong when you're weak. These are very psychological concepts that can be applied in our cybersecurity strategy. A great example of this is honeypots and honey nets. Showing a, an obvious vulnerability so that the attacker will go after that vulnerability instead of the real assets on your network. That's a perfect example of deception, of how you can avoid a 2,000 plus year old strategy to your cybersecurity program and strategy and defense plan. Be extremely subtle, even to the point of formlessness. Be mysterious to the point of soundlessness. Thereby, you can be the director of the opponent's fate. How powerful Sun Tzu's words are, even translated to English. At the end of the day, it's unacceptable for any organization to not have strong governance, risk governance, security policies and programs, employing separation of duties for confidentiality measures, employing mandatory vacations for integrity factors, for least privileges to least functionality. A good question is, does anyone know the difference between a least privilege and least functionality? So least privilege is the amount of rights that you give a, a, an account or user to be able to perform the job that needs to be done, the minimal amount. Whereas least functionality, this goes into applications. How many functions? Because if you have certain requirements and you start to gold plate it or add additional bells and whistles, those bells and whistles also require extra code, extra potential vulnerabilities and holes that can be opened up into it. So the concept of least functionality is, hey, we need an application to do A, B, C. X, Y, Z would be nice to have, but you know what? This is our requirement. We're going to stick to the requirement. So at least functionality is very important and often gets overlooked in a lot of security programs or at least acquisition, IT acquisition strategies. Attacks happen every day. There's a, Norse has a great map, uh, IP Viking, uh, several other companies have the, the attack maps. You see the denials, have, have you seen at least one denial of service attack map online? If you haven't, we can provide links to you uh, later with these slides. But attacks are happening all the time. Even as we sit here, there are thousands of attacks occurring every second. So attacking is going to happen, but how prepared and how ready will we be to receive those attacks is the question that we need to ask ourselves. So because incidents will occur, anything from data spillages to you know information of clearance classification issues with information that goes out to the public that shouldn't, it's going to happen. So, but how quickly, accurately, and complete you handle that is critical to the recovery. So what is your incident response plan? Are the people that are running the incident response plan fully trained? Have they done drills? Have they done tabletops? Have they actually did parallel exercises? I know this theater in particular gets a lot of hands-on practice. So are they documenting lessons learned? Are they using previous incidents they've had to, to prevent future incidents. Again, every battle is won before it is fought. It starts with 
Senior leadership providing the strategy to steer the organization the direction it should go to the middle management, down to the user level. Everybody has to be on the same sheet of music for your security program for it to be effective. Any questions? Well, I would like to thank Mr. Washington. I would like to thank the leadership for having me out. I really appreciate to be out here. Uh, I'm here for the whole conference, so if you see me, feel free to pick my brain. I've mentored and trained uh, hundreds of NCOs and officers uh, in USERA, here at, here at Arsent, and, um, and over, actually worldwide. I do have a cybersecurity test tips book. It's one of the best sellers from Amazon, but I have mentored and trained literally hundreds of folks on their certifications and their careers. So thank you very much for having me. Have a great day.